items before we get started. First, all attendees will be on mute throughout the presentation. If you have any questions about the content, feel free to type them into the Q&A box and we will be answering those at the end of the webinar. As you're listening, if you experience any technical issues, please type these into the chat box. Um, we will be monitoring those and get with you for immediate assistance. Lastly, we are recording the webinar and we'll be sending out a follow-up email with the recording to all registrants. All right, welcome to our webinar, Five Steps to Set Up Your AI Organization. Since Corp has been around for over two decades, offering a variety of consulting services across data, digital, and business transformation. Our team of skilled consultants offers insights and solutions to the most important problems facing business and government. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker at SenseCorp with expertise in big data, predictive modeling, and programming, delivering a strategic big data and analytic solutions to help her clients make data-driven decisions. She has over a decade of experience in the full life cycle of data science projects, from data engineering and quality assurance to model deployment, interpretation and data visualization in a variety of industries, including biotechnology, retail, and oil and gas. Okay, thank you all for attending today's webinar. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Susan, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Kelly. And I look forward um, to sharing some of my experience and insights with you all today and appreciate you joining in. So artificial intelligence and associated technologies and advanced analytics and machine learning are poised to be the innovation of the next decade, delivering over 13 trillion additional dollars in global economic activity but fewer than 39% of companies have an existing AI strategy in place. So my goal for today is to discuss some of the common challenges and roadblocks that I see in companies at various stages of their AI maturity. And I'm going to discuss five steps for creating a strong foundation to ensure value and return on your investment as you develop your AI strategy within your organization. So what is AI and why is it so powerful and valuable? Well, we've always had data and analytics. Um, those aren't new uh, strategies, but there are several innovations that have come together to allow us to make this transformation and that are really quite different than what we've seen in the past. So first, in terms of data, some of us on the call may actually have been around long enough that we used to have data that wasn't even digital. We had, um, you know, you know, paper books, we had kind of paper records. Um, and now we have every click, every order, data about every customer, all of this information as recorded digitally and it's stored. And because storage is so cheap and we have cloud storage, we have on-premise storage, um, this allows us to store this data basically in perpetuity as long as we want and we can access it instantly. So that's a real revolution. The next thing is computation. So it wasn't until the last decade or so that distributed computing, parallel processing, that those uh, became widely available to allow us to have the computational power to actually extract insights from this data. Even 10 years ago, it just wouldn't have been possible to really be able to look at this data in any sort of meaningful way because we just didn't have the computation to be able to do it. And finally, the last um, step or the last sort of piece of this are the computational tools. So machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, those are the tools that allow us to make sense of this data. This data that before um, would just be this sort of big, um, you know, mess, this big um, kind of 
you know, backlog that we wouldn't be able to really get any sort of meaningful insight from. Now we have um, computational tools um, and computing tools to really allow us to make sense of it and extract really powerful and meaningful insights. But there are still many misunderstandings about AI. Um, so it can have a science fiction connotation. Often when people hear of AI, they often think of Hollywood portrayals. So Terminator, WALL-E, um, maybe they're fearful of AI potentially taking away their job, um, making them obsolete. So a large part of setting up your AI organization successfully is going to be to focus on educating your employees, educating your customers, um, so that they understand and can embrace the AI journey and really see the value of the investment that you're making. And I'll talk more about this as we go through the slides. Secondly, I want to point out that AI is really a journey. It's a journey in terms of the technology, but also in terms of how we actually set up AI within our organizations. So on the left side here, you can see where we are today. The AI that we have today is really powerful, but we still classify it as weak AI. So it's solving a relatively narrow set of problems um, that are essentially devised by a human. There may be sort of superhuman computation and that, you know, the the scale of the data, the scale of the problem is more than kind of a single human could hold in their head. Um, so you could think about like the decisions that are made by um, a self-driving car um, and medical diagnostics. We see that um, image analysis, particularly for um, scans for cancer, for instance, for tumor detection, um, that those actually can be more accurate um, and, and certainly many orders of magnitude faster than what a human can do. But we still define those as narrow in the sense that they're sort of a single type of problem that's being um, uh, addressed in every instance there. As we move up and as we think about where the technology is going, where the field is going, we move into something that we think more as strong artificial intelligence or um, sort of general artificial intelligence. And so that's the idea that we have the ability um, to build technology solutions, to build AI solutions that can solve novel problems. So they they aren't trained on a single type of problem to do that well. They can actually learn to recognize and solve um, new, new problems as they arise. Um, and um, that we can, I think we can all sort of think of the um, you know, possibilities and innovation with that in terms of thinking about sort of like the self-learning. So an AI that could sort of teach itself. Um, and then we're moving all the way up to this artificial super intelligence. So this is sort of in the, in the future, but where the field is going. And so that's where we think about bionics. We think about nanobots, so tiny robots that could do maybe surgery or could, um, you know, fix mechanical problems um, where a human isn't, you know, isn't actually part of developing that solution. The, the AI um, intelligence is, is, is working on its own. So the next um, thing I want to point out on the right hand side is that AI is a journey in terms of our organization. So today we're going to talk about setting up your organization and we use a metaphor of climbing a mountain. And it's not a single mountain. So if anybody's been, you know, hiking before, often, you know, if you're going to like hike up a mountain, hike up a peak, you know, you sort of start climbing up and at a certain point you reach a point and you realize I'm not even climbing the mountain yet right? The mountain is off there in the distance. Um, and so when we're thinking about our AI journey, it's a similar metaphor where we're, we're climbing up the first summit, um, but there's many summits um, to achieve. And so today we'll be talking about setting up your organization, which is the first step and is really critical step in terms of establishing your foundation. Um, but there's also the steps of sustaining um, and scaling AI within your organization. And um, 
the thoughts and ideas that are um, uh, presented today and the other two mountains as well are part of our um, AI ebook, which um, you should have all received a copy of. And if you haven't, um, we'll have a link afterwards um, to that ebook, which covers um, all three of these um, mountains. And I just want to point out that, you know, developing, we're going to focus on setting up uh, AI within your organization today, um, and um, this talk is geared to both uh, organizations that are just at the early stages of setting up, um, but also even if you're a little bit further along in your maturity in terms of setting up, you maybe already have um, an AI or data science um, group within your organization. I think focusing and hearing about these setup steps um, and making sure that you have a strong foundation um, is really important before thinking about these other steps of sustaining and scaling your strategy. And so with that, I just wanted to give a few examples because I think, um, you know, we all use AI, you know, in our lives and technology um, every day. So, you know, voice assistants, you know, Alexa, Siri, all of that is, you um, AI, even the, um, you know, voice to text um, on your phone, um, you know, filters on Instagram or Snapchat, right? All of those are using um, AI. So in terms of the technology um, and the kind of technology, technological world and technology companies, obviously they've invested heavy in AI and those are things that we use every day. However, even within very traditional industries, this AI revolution is happening. Um, you know, we see it in oil and gas, we see it in, um, you know, construction and manufacturing supply, um, we see it in healthcare, we see it in the public sector. So obviously all of us right now um, with uh, COVID and the um, issues that are going on right now, right? We see public health, disease tracking. We see how important that um, AI modeling is both in terms of public health, contact tracing, emergency management, um, uh, et cetera. And I just want to, you know, really emphasize that, you know, sort of no matter what our industry is, you know, you could take sort of the most, um, you know, sort of traditional kind of brick and mortar um, industry. I mean, I think, you know, construction is probably a good example um, of that. AI has the possibility to really transform um, how we do business to increase efficiency. And what we see in our work at SenseCorp is, you know, companies that that make that investment, they really reap the rewards. Um, and I want to point out, you know, often, I think sometimes we can think about AI as this sort of like investment that we're making, um, you know, as we go and kind of reach a, a next sort of step or thinking about expansion. Um, but AI can be really critical in terms of uh, developing um, value and, um, the way I think about it is, you know, the data that we have, um, all of our historical data that we have within our company, whatever our industry is, um, that is an asset. Um, that is an asset that we may not be using right now. Um, and implementing um, a, a data science and AI strategy is going to let us unlock value um, from that data. So um, as an example, um, working, uh, have worked with a client that is in the construction industry. Um, and, you know, obviously the conditions right now with COVID, they're very different. Um, we're trying, everybody's trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Um, well, we can look within the historical data within that company and look at other disruptions um, like hurricanes, um, looking at Hurricane Sandy, um, Hurricane Harvey in uh, Houston and being able to uh, start to develop predictions about what we might think, um, you know, what what do historical patterns look like when we come out of a disruption? How um, how do things ramp up? Where does demand um, spike? Um, how does how quickly do things come back online? Um, those are insights that we can get from their historical data that are really critical to make even in this really challenging time. 
So the five steps, um, I'm going to outline them here, and then I will um, go into each one in more detail. The first step is to start with the right team. The second step is to ideate and prioritize your use cases. The third step is to set up rapid technology enablement. And these first three steps are really focused on getting the right team, getting the right problems, and being able to develop value quickly. I'll talk more about this um, at each step, but it is an investment. Um, these are uh, expensive um, you know, people to hire potentially. Um, there's a lot of initial investment that can be required. And so you wanna start getting value right away. And so these first three steps are really focused on setting you up in a position where you can start to generate value from your AI team right away. The last, uh, the fourth step is to prove, approve, and build solutions. And then the final step is to educate your organization on AI knowledge. So just a few terms um, going through. I've been using the term AI or artificial intelligence. We talk, kind of talked about what that is, narrow and um, strong AI. Um, data science is the field of study that sort of combines um, uh, programming, math and statistics to get insights from data. So data science and data scientists are often the ones who are using um, AI uh, to, to get those insights. Machine learning is a subfield of AI where algorithms can learn and change automatically. So they don't require um, a human to actually sort of um, kind of update the statistics to evaluate the models um, uh, at kind of each step of the model. They can optimize and update, um, and they're very useful for looking for patterns within the data and allow us to make predictions about future outcomes. Deep learning is a term you may have heard, and this is a specific subfield of machine learning. Um, it uh, can also be called um, neural networks or deep neural networks. This is essentially a specific type of machine learning um, that mimics the structure um, of the human brain and the neurons, and it's particularly useful in really complex problems like image recognition, computer vision, um, text and speech recognition, um, and is, again, is this sort of, uh, you know, rapidly developing um, field within artificial intelligence. So the first step, starting with the right team. So there are five key roles that we've identified as being really important and really critical in terms of uh, your AI team or your data science team. And the data scientist is part of this, um, but I like to start with the AI evangelist. So this is someone who is a leader within the organization. Um, they may be an executive, um, and they are really focused on setting up the team, being responsible for the AI team, and the AI vision for the organization. They're gonna be really critical in ensuring success for the team, ensuring resources for the team, and helping um, the team stay on track, um, and helping with uh, making sure that the organization as a whole um, understands what the AI team is, is doing. So the data scientist is a really critical piece um, of the team. And I wonder how many of us that are on the call are in an organization or have been part of an organization where the data scientist is really called upon to do everything. They're the one who actually is being the evangelist, the one who is trying to educate the organization about what data science and AI can do um, for their company. They're doing the data science itself, they're preparing the data, um, they're coming up with the visualizations and, and making um, you know, business presentations. Um, 
it's very hard for the data scientist to be able to focus on developing uh, solutions, developing their data science models when they're doing all of those other pieces. Um, and so the junior data scientist um, is really critical because they can help the data scientist um, and they really represent kind of an early um, investment in hiring and staffing, um, and they take direction from, from the data scientist. Another really critical piece that I often see uh, understaffed are the data engineers. So the data engineer um, is a really critical person. They are an expert that has the ability to acquire Acquire, transform, cleanse, prepare data. Um, they will prepare the data that you have, um, internal data, whether that's you know in a data warehouse, um, whatever your data strategy um, is within your organization. The data engineer will help prepare the data for the data scientist to be able to model. Um, they may also um, help with um, extracting um, third-party data sets if you've determined that you um, want or need to use those within your AI strategy. Um, they're really critical. They specialize in that data preparation piece um, and they let the data scientists be able to focus on their modeling activities. Another really critical piece is a business analyst. And the business analyst, analyst is somebody going to be somebody who has a really strong um, knowledge of the business oper operations and processes, and they really prof provide that specific expertise and support, um, and they really help make sure that the data scientist is um, talking the same language as the business folks within your organization. Um, they really help sort of translate. Um, often they can help with visualizations and, and are a really critical uh, piece of that team. So four steps to set up your team for success. So when you're setting up your team, you first want to start small. Um, so the previous slide had five people on it. That may be the size of your entire data science um, team. Often um, at SimsCorp, what we will do is um, come in when a company is interested in establishing an AI strategy and an AI organization, we will come in and essentially serve in that chief data scientist role, helping develop the initial use cases, um, helping um, with hiring and staffing um, for those other positions um, so that an organization can, can really get set up and running. Um, keeping your team small initially lets you um, have rapid um, success, lets your team um, uh, be agile, and you can um, and, and able to quickly get insights. So the next step is focusing on the roles. So think of the roles, um, the five that I mentioned in the previous slide, and how best to staff them. So don't just default to putting someone in a role because maybe they've indicated interest or because they're available. Really think about the roles that we described and whether the person fits the role, whether they have the necessary skills. And again, often we will come in and essentially serve as um, interim either data scientist, data engineer, in this role um, while uh, a company is figuring out what their staffing needs are uh, so that they can um, be set up to do that uh, in the best way possible. The next step is running it like a project. So have defined goals and have an, a, a defined timeline and really set up a sense of urgency across the organization. So often when we're setting uh, something up, um, we can really get into this try it out kind of mentality, um, like we're starting this, we're going to try it out, see how it goes. We have a lot of different things we're going to potentially look at, see what sticks. Um, it's very easy. If you don't have defined goals, you're gonna a year later, you're gonna be in the same place where you haven't accomplished anything tangible. You may have started a lot of um, a lot of things, but have yet to actually deliver value. And again, 
these teams are not, um, you know, they, these are expensive uh, positions to staff and fill, um, and you wanted it to get value right away. The last step is housing it within the business. I actually just read um, an article within um, from HBR where they were actually talking about, you know, that the data science science teams or AI teams um, they recommended that they report directly to the CEO. That may not be a possible strategy for all companies, um, but certainly establishing your AI team within a business unit, either operations or finance, um, rather than within IT. So why not IT? Well, often we do see data science AI teams within. IT, so you know they involve data that you know the IT team may be um, involved with you know the data um, uh, side of things, the kind of technology side of the organization. Um, but when we see a data science team end up siloed within information technology, they often aren't again aren't able to deliver those kind of business insights. Often we see them kind of working on the wrong problems or spending a lot of effort um, and maybe doing a great job with their models, but it's, it's not the right question. They're not asking um, or addressing the questions that have um, the largest um, business value. Um, and so establishing your AI team within operations or finance um, or, you know, reporting directly um, to an executive that that allows it to have that business relevance um, to be really tightly linked there. So the second step is to ideate and prioritize your use cases. So what do I mean by that? So when we're thinking about this, I've mentioned this several times, this is expensive to set up this organization. And so before you, before you do this, think about what you wanna do, right? Come up with your strategy, develop your pipeline. Um, you may use team time for any sort of ramp up and training that you need to do um, developing your uh, data pipelines, your modeling pipelines, um, before you actually start trying to build anything. This is, I think of that like sort of, you know, measure twice, cut once, right? So you wanna come up with um, kind of your plan of what you wanna do before you actually start trying to do it. Next is involving the organization. So expand your idea generation beyond your AI team. Um, so crowdsource ideas for AI projects from the organization. I've seen this used to great effect um, in several different organizations where they either have um, a contest or they have kind of an open um, call for potential AI pro projects and you'll be amazed at some of the suggestions that people have some of them will be silly sure like a robot that's gonna you know deliver beer at happy hour but some of them could potentially be really powerful and really lets you know um, where some of those um, kind of low-hanging fruit of potential applications um, for AI may be. And it also really helps generate um, buy-in. Um, so it gets people excited about what you're doing. Um, and it also helps educate them. And I'll talk more about this in the fifth step. Um, but involving the organization um, from the beginning um, is a, a key recommendation. So next, um, don't discount small data. And I would even say start small, right? Don't get caught up on, you know, I want to look at, you know, our entire you know, 20 years of, um, you know, history, or I want to look at, you know, every possible segment um, uh, of our customers. Um, start small, get momentum. Um, so stay focused, work with existing data sets. Um, again, and if you're within the business unit, you know what types of data, you know what the kind of problems are um, that are salient and um, have the potential to um, generate value. Start with those. I think um, in AI, you know, I'm a you know, scientist by training. It's often, um, you know, we get excited about the like big, hard problems. We would like to have, you know, sort of, I think you asked a data science star. I was like, oh, I'd like more data, right? Well, 
no, we need to go with the data that we have um, so that we can generate value now. Um, and that also helps us think about what we might want to use in the future, right? So those early smaller use cases can be really powerful in helping us develop our overall long-term strategy and help us know what's going to be uh, fruitful for further exploration and um, what might be a dead end. Um, and uh, we're going to move on to something else. And then next, um, assess those pro projects judiciously. So what do I mean? Again, this is similar to the don't discount small data, but trim down your use cases. So have them be really focused. Choose small projects um, that have high value and low complexity. Again, it's easy to get caught up in the sort of, you know, pie in the sky um, use case. And those can be really um, great for thinking about, um, you know, visioning for the future. But when we're really thinking about what we want to get started on actually doing, we want the projects that have low complexity that are going to have a high probability of success um, and that are going to generate high value. So when we're thinking about this, you know, any sort of a use case that we can um, do that's going to generate revenue, um, that's going to be very easy to show the value of the investment kind of from the beginning. So anytime that we can uh, identify and assess those initial use cases and really choose these projects that are going to either generate value or cut cost, um, those are going to give us some quick wins. So the third step is setting up rapid technology enablement. And what do I mean by this? Well, within the landscape of AI, within the landscape of technology, it's very easy to get caught up in finding the perfect tool. And, um, you know, the saying, it's the best tool is the one that gets the job done. Right. And so part of this um, is thinking about, you know, the tool landscape, the technology landscape is constantly changing. Your needs may change as your organization develops. Um, and so you don't want to get caught up in the step of trying to procure the technology. You want to be able to get started generating value running analyses, um, coming up with insights um, at the same time while you're evaluating the tool landscape, um, but you don't want it to hold you back. So four steps that you can do to equip your team with the right tools. The first one is starting with lease options. So this site is the idea of trying before you buy. Most companies um, that we work with um, actually trying to think of one that doesn't, I, I might even say all companies that we work with. Um, so they're all using some sort of cloud tools. Um, those cloud tools are really powerful. They can also get expensive really quickly. Um, and so deciding on what the right platform um, is, what the right tools are going to be, um, Again, you can um, spend a lot of time, you can also spend a lot of money, um, and the procurement process can, can drag on. So you wanna make sure that you're able to get started right away, and often we can do this by um, you know, leasing platform access. So using a kind of short-term um, uh, short term use of uh, a cloud technology, a platform, so that you can get started generating insights while you decide what the exact tools are that you're going to need. As you're doing that, so it's like you want to get started, you do want to make sure that you are aligned with your data scientist. Um, so for those initial use cases, you want to make sure that you are using a consistent technology platform. So you don't want your you know, data scientists and your business analysts and your data engineer um, to not have a consistent platform that they can be using together. You will do your uh, final evaluations and procurement of technology at a later step, um, but you do want to make sure that your data scientist is on board um, and is part of the conversations as you're um, exploring those technology tools. And again, this is something that we often do.
do for clients um, uh, at SenseCorp is we will come in and help uh, a company, we'll develop initial use cases um, for them, and we'll also make technology recommendations based on what are their current technologies that they're using um, and what their future needs um, might be depending on where they want to go with their AI strategy. And you really, I said this already, but I sort of can't emphasize it um, enough. So often we see companies um, and data science teams really getting stuck at this step. So the technology uh, tool landscape, I mean, it's not infinite, but it seems like it could be infinite, right? There are so many tools constantly new tools, new functionality is being added. It could be a full-time job just to sort of explore that technology space. You really want to remove that piece from your critical path. Obviously, technology evaluation is an important um, piece, but you don't want to have your data science and modeling activities really dependent on the technology evaluation and procurement, um, because often those types, those timelines can be kind of outside of the control of the team. Um, and so you want to make sure that they can uh, develop those insights um, without being um, kind of hampered by technology and by that process. And then the last step that is really uh, important and I want to emphasize, make sure that you're building in data security into your uh, pipelines and your workflow um, from the beginning, particularly if you are, for instance, you know, moving maybe from um, on-premise or maybe you're moving from one cloud um, provider, maybe cloud storage into uh, computing or machine learning um, environment in the cloud, you want to make sure that you you're protecting the organization's data, that you have strong policies um, to keep your data secure. So using, you know, keys, um, using uh, tools to keep your data secure and making sure that that is built in uh, from the very beginning and that it becomes part of the culture of your, um, of your AI team, both in terms of data and also in terms of your of your code. So having sort of good practices established um, from the very beginning um, so that you're not, um, not backtracking um, or solving bad habits later. So the AI tool landscape I mentioned, um, you know, it is really, um, really big. It's constantly evolving depending on your industry and your field. You may have different sorts of needs. Um, you may also have um, some tools like, for instance, um, visualization tools like maybe Tableau or uh, Power BI. You are already using those within your organization. Um, so you'll have certain um, tools that you already have. Um, you may have uh, data wrangling um, kind of ETL tools already um, built into your organization. And you also may have new tools that you're developing, like the AI tools, um, uh, like maybe even um, an external cloud kind of data science platform that you're evaluating. I do want to point out um, the code management tools uh, are really critical in terms of making sure that your code is um, maintained, that um, you're maintaining proper version control um, so that your team can all work together um, to, manage, um, to manage their code. And, um, you know, you, you may not need all of these tools, um, but they're out there. And again, the chief data scientist, this is going to be their role is helping you, um, you and your organization figure out what tools you need. Um, and often we come in at SenseCorp to help companies evaluate that technology and tool landscape and figure out what the existing tools are that the organization is already using um, and what we would recommend um, in terms of future investment. So the fourth step is to prove, approve, and build solutions. 
So here we're thinking about the art of the possible and also the art of the feasible. So the art of the feasible is typically what a CIO, a chief information officer might be thinking about. What um, is possible in terms of the technology, in terms of the art of the possible, this is what we're really thinking about in terms of the executives, the business leaders. What, what is the possible um, outcomes in terms of the business? Where do we see the value um, that, we can, um, that we can create and we can leverage in terms of uh, AI and data science? So as we're doing this, and we start developing AI solutions, we really want to plan for agility. So again, we've started small, we have a small team, we're working on these small initial use cases. We can prove, approve, and build plans based on these use cases. We're working with available technology. This lets us be flexible and adaptive, um, and we can switch to a different um, route, either a different technology, a different use case, um, depending on if there are roadblocks. You know, maybe we find that you know the use case that we chose we're we're not generating the value that we thought we would, so we can pivot. Um, so building in that agile, um, uh, that agile mindset. So starting with a proof of concept. So we want to ensure that the technology works and then it can solve the initial use cases. Um, so we want to do some preliminary analysis to make sure that we can actually do it, right? That the data is there, the technology is there, um, that lets us uh, uh, generate the value that we think we're going to be able to do. And then the next step is developing a proof of value. So showing what can be done. And again, this is that um, business use case. So creating uh, a vignette so we can look at the business impact of the AI solution. So we can really see where the value uh, is coming from. And again, as I mentioned before, um, picking those initial use cases that um, can uh, generate higher revenue, those are going to be really valuable um, in showing, um, uh, really proving out the value. And so developing those models for those initial use cases. Um, so this is where you're actually doing the AI and the modeling. And in this um, case, we're really wanting to have an iterative approach. So I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but this isn't sort of a single step. Um, we're going to be um, uh, refining our model. We're going to be kind of generating an, a model and an insight. We're going to be checking it against um, uh, the business um, experts so that we are fine tuning our narrative um, and uh, helping us uh, develop those next steps. So what does that look like? So um, on the left hand side here, you can see um, this is a really simple example of like an A, B test, maybe for a website. Um, so you can see, you know, if we have a, a big picture here versus two small pictures, what happens? Well, we get, you know, 25% clicks. Well, if we have a big picture, we get 50% um, of people clicking through. So this is if we're implementing our strategies in an experimental way, and again, this is where your data scientist is going to help you out, you can um, be able to quantify um, what your impact is. And as you do this, you'll first create your initial assessment, you'll gather your requirements, you'll um, develop your model and validate it. Um, and then depending on um, how your model is doing and what um, sort of value and what sort of gain you're getting, you will repeat these steps, right? So you might um, have an additional um, additional data that you add to the model. You might um, uh, do additional um, preparation or transformation of the data. Um, you might have some um, extra quality steps that you go through, quality assessment steps um, that you go through to try to refine um, this model and get it to be the best that you can be um, before you operationalize and deploy your model. And after you do that, you still have a support piece. Um, so once your model is developed and deployed, um, you want to think about how often do you have to reevaluate your model? Um, uh, how um, do you feed um, new data into your model? How do you know if your model is starting to drift? 
um, et cetera. So that needs to be part of the plan. So the fifth and final step is educating your organization on AI. And when you think about setting up your AI organization, this is a really critical uh, piece. So 72% of people are afraid of a future where robots and computers will take over their tasks. So again, these are the same 72% of the people who, you know, love that Alexa will play whatever song they want for them and tell them what the weather is. So it's not that people are scared of technology per se, but I do think there is uh, some misunderstanding um, that makes people fearful. And in particular, people are fearful about their jobs. So um, when we think about how we can um, combat this, when we think about how we can um, help educate our um, companies, I think creating a data-driven organization, realizing that data is an asset for your company that you want to protect just like any other um, physical asset that you have um, is really key and it's really a, you know, a mindset transformation. So 69% of companies um, say that they are not yet treating data as a business asset and that they're not, 53% um, say that they're not running their company as a data-driven organization. These are key um, uh, organizational um, management pieces that need to be part of your AI strategy. And it uh, doing this allows us to really be competitive in terms of data and analytics. So how do we do this? Well, the first step is to just create a common foundational understanding. So dispelling myths about AI um, and really targeting executives who can really become um, proponents of the AI program, um, who have the vision to understand how AI can really transform your organization and how AI may be really critical for the success and continued um, uh, existence and profit profitability of your organization. Um, so just having that coming from the top, I think is really important. So uh, I mentioned this previously, but you know, you you know, you did that contest where you had people come up with ideas for how AI um, could help them in their jobs. So showcase um, the use of AI through current use cases. Um, show people how AI is really making their jobs easier. Um, we uh, have a client that's an oil and gas um, company. They have a lot of, uh, it's a service, oil and gas service company, so they have a lot of um, technicians that, um, you know, work in really remote uh, places out in oil and gas fields, and um, just getting access to uh, the information that they need to be able to do their job, um, you know, manuals, um, that kind of thing is really uh, a challenge for them. And so having um, a smart assistant um, that can uh, serve up uh, the manuals for the particular um, type of uh, unit and machine that they're gonna go and work on so that you don't have to pull it up themselves um, so that it'll be pulled up automatically um, onto their tablet so that they don't have to worry about um, trying to pull it up in the field where they may have a spotty internet connection. Right, that's a really tangible way that will make um, those uh, technicians' lives easier. It doesn't um, in any way um, replace the technicians or even threaten them, um, but it lets them do their jobs that they need to do um, better so that they can focus on um, the actual um, skills and value that they, that they provide as highly trained technicians rather than, um, you know, somebody who is, you know, stuck in the middle of nowhere, you know, fighting with their, um, you know, spot body, cell, internet connection. Um, so really exploring those ideas and really highlighting them and generating a lot of excitement. Investing in change management. So I talked about that kind of previous piece about being becoming a data-driven organization. Um, so discussing the AI transformation with influencers within your company, addressing those um, potential concerns, and really highlighting that in the future, workers in our company are gonna be working with AI to make their jobs better, um, not be eliminated by AI. 
And then also assessing the competition. Um, so one way I think to you know get on board with this is thinking about well you know our competitors are already you know are already doing this so we need to be doing it too um, so just exploring and reporting on what the competition is doing highlighting the competitive landscape highlighting where um, you and your company are making investments um, in AI that um, has the potential um, to really transform. Um, your company and provide value, uh, it can be really, um, really key. So it's a lot of information. Um, again, this information is available um, in our ebook. If you haven't already um, received it, we'll send out a link um, with the slides afterwards. But my three key takeaways, my kind of three biggest pieces of advice, the first one would be to plan, spend time planning, build the right team. Think about um, what your needs are. Think about um, making sure that you're putting the right people um, uh, into those roles that have the right um, skill sets. Starting small, use existing tools and existing data sets to generate quick wins. Um, in the future, there will be time to really expand both of those, the tools and the data sets. Um, but in the beginning, you want to get, get started right away. And the way to do that is really focusing on the business value. So use business value as your um, metric for evaluating your use cases so that the use cases that you start out with are those that are really going to generate um, value for you. Um, focus on the right problems. Um, often when we come into companies that have an existing uh, data science team or AI team and strategy, um, but they're not getting the value that they that they hoped they would, it's not because their data science team, you know, isn't functional or sort of isn't good, aren't bright, or, you know, aren't doing the right things. Um, the most common problem we see is that people are just, they're solving the wrong problems, right? They're not working on the right problems. Um, so focus on the business value, keep your AI team within a business unit um, can help with that. And so, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're climbing the mountain. So today we talked about um, setting up your AI team um, and making those initial investments and establishing momentum. In the future, we'll cover our second and third mountain where we're focusing on really capturing the AI value and planning those longer term investments and then um, scaling, so expanding your AI reach and really um, focusing on those people process and technology investments for the long term. And again, these are available in our ebook. I thank you for joining us today and would be happy to take any questions uh, in the remaining time. Kelly will uh, field uh, the questions for us. So if you have any questions, you can put them um, into the question box. Thanks so much. Thank you, Susan. That was great. That was a lot of information. Um, we'll just wait a few minutes to see if anybody has any questions here. And just a reminder that you will be receiving a follow-up email after the webinar um, that has the recording of the webinar and a link for the ebook download. Okay, I do see one question here, Susan. I think we have at least time for that one. Mm -hmm. um, how do you suggest selecting a use case? So I think with uh, when we're you know when we're thinking about choosing a use case. Often what we do is, um, you know, when we come in um, to an organization, um, helping them identify those initial use cases, we will um, kind of develop a matrix in terms of, you know, what are the use cases? So we'll have, you know, kind of brainstorming, you know, strategies come up with, you know, a bunch of questions um, that we could answer. And each of those then we rank in terms of their technological feasibility, the kind of data feasibility, um, so kind of ease of solving. And um, so that's kind of one axis. And then the second axis is that business value. 
So there's a lot of potential problems that you can tackle um, and kind of coming up with all of the, you know, the problems, kind of getting them down in a brainstorming session and then ranking them in terms of those two things, um, the feasibility and the value piece lets you then kind of sift through the ones at the top, right? And identify the ones that have that technological feasibility and then they're gonna generate the highest value. And from that, you know, often we have four or five candidates um, and, and then, you know, can decide from there. But I think ranking them in terms of those two things um, is really helpful and really eye-opening. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, and also for anybody that is still interested in learning more about that, we actually do have a blog post about that. And if you would like, if you want to email uh, marketing at sensecorp.com, I'm happy to send you the link to that blog post. All right, Susan, let's see. Um, we have a comment that someone says, great point on making change management a part of your AI strategy. Any thoughts on how to effectively make it happen? Well, I mean, you know, we have a whole group at SunsCorp that's focused on um, change management. And I think, you know, one of the um, things that maybe can get missed in terms of developing AI, you know, is that change management piece because, you know, we're thinking a lot about that kind of technology and, and um, piece of it rather than the people in process, um, but that those are kind of equally important. Um, and so when we are going in to help a company develop um, their strategy, often we do kind of a road mapping, um, kind of short term, um, six to eight week project where we're really helping a company kind of set up where, where their roadmap is going to be and develop those initial use cases. Um, that change management is a big is a big part of it as well. Um, and, you know, the actual strategies for that, I think, um, aren't, you know, particularly different from any other type of change management in terms of thinking about um, influencers, thinking about communication, um, thinking about early adopters, um, and, and using all of those great things that we know about OCM um, and just applying it within this context. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Susan. Um, if anybody on the line has any other questions or comments, feel free to email us at marketing at and we'll be happy to get back um, with any answers. Otherwise, we are going to wrap up here for the day. Um, thanks for your time, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.